here. Uh, again, we're going to continue our series on Back to Basics. We're uh, coming to a close on this. Uh, we will probably be finished in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's been a good series. Uh, I've had a lot of good positive feedback from it. Um, we're going to move beyond basics. Um, uh, matter of fact, that sounds like a sermon series right there, doesn't it, TR? Beyond basics. Uh, that, that may be what we're doing next. Um, but we're going to finish talking about the work of the church uh, in, the next couple of, in the next couple of weeks, and then we're going to, uh, to move on to some other things. But um, as we continue talking about the work of the church, we're going to talk about benevolence today. Now, I have talked a lot about benevolence. I've talked a lot about giving. I've talked a lot about the work that we need to be about doing. And so today's lesson, again, we're going back to the very basics of this, is going to be kind of a recap. It's going to be kind of a, a summarization of what we need to do and the mentality that we need to have when it comes to benevolence. Uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about giving, talked about one of the aspects of giving is the aspect of benevolence, uh, of doing for others, uh, of giving of ourselves, of giving of our time, of giving of our resources, uh, of giving of our energy, uh, paying attention to something. It's all part and parcel of benevolence, and we do want to talk about some of those things as we look at this lesson today. And so the basic idea, the basic concept behind benevolence is to do something for someone else without the expectation of repayment. That's basically a good working definition of what benevolence is. It's the idea that I see somebody who needs something, and I am going to go to that person in, in whatever manner needs to be done. I'm going to go to that person, and I'm going to do something, I'm going to give something, without the expectation of getting anything in return. And in fact, I would go one step further, not just without the expectation of getting something in return, but of expecting to not get something in return. And, and that's because when you give to somebody, you don't do it for repayment, that's called a loan. Uh, when you give to somebody, you do so because they have need and you have surplus. And we don't expect to get repaid. We expect to not be repaid. And, and so this is kind of the, the basic idea, the basic understanding of benevolence. And there's one passage that I particularly like when it comes to time to talking about doing good for others, when it comes time for benevolence. And that's the passage here in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles there, we're going to spend a good part of our time today in that particular passage. And then we're going to look at a lot of other passages uh, briefly. We're going to summarize what they say when it comes time to giving, how to give, why to give, those kinds of things. So when we look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, the first thing we see here is Paul starts off, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, as we look at this, uh, we think about benevolence, we think about giving, but we also think about that very interesting, and one may even say odd way that Paul opens up this particular passage when he talks about the fact that we should not be deceived because God will not be mocked. Now, one of the things that we have to understand about this, and as we're looking at this passage, is that the whole passage has to do with good works, including verse 7, where he says, uh, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. There is a reason why that is in there. There is a particular reason why Paul starts off with this conversation about deception. It seems that the deception that the Galatians were facing uh, has to do with helping one another, or more specifically, a failure to do so. Now, there were a lot of challenges going on in Galatia, perhaps not as many as, say, there were in Corinth uh, or Ephesus, but, but there were a lot of challenges going on there. There were some people who were trying to pull them away from the gospel. There were others who were trying to get them to follow after the law of Moses. Uh, and yet we see here that this idea of benevolence, this idea of good, doing good for others, was something that Paul also felt the need to address. And so he wanted them to understand they needed to be about doing good and for them to think that they did not have to. For them to think that this was not something they were called to do 
was a lie, was a deception that they were facing. And so Paul wants to clear this up. He wants to point them in the right direction about doing good. And so Paul issues a very stern warning for them and for us. He issues a very stern warning when he tells them to understand that God is not going to be mocked. And so think about this particular warning here. He says God is not, is not mocked. Now, you may fool men. And you may fool men consistently. You may fool everybody. You may even think that you are going to fool yourself. You're going to lie to yourself and, and, and do all of those things. But understand, we're never going to fool God. God will not be mocked. You will not be able to use God's name in one aspect of your life and abandon God's name in another aspect and think God is not going to notice. You will not be able to cling to the gospel message for the things that you like and, and leave the other things that you dislike alone and think that God will not notice. Nothing could be further from the truth because God notices all of these things. God expects you to dedicate your entire life, your entire self, over to Him. And so He says, God is not mocked. And He also says that corruption awaits a life lived in sin. What does this have to do with benevolence? Everything. Because if we aren't ready and willing to give to those who are in need. There is one reason for that, and that reason is selfishness. And if we are unwilling to follow God, if we are unwilling to give as God has told us we should give, if we are unwilling to share what God has blessed us with, then we are living a life of selfishness. And Paul warns us about sowing to our own flesh. If I am living a life that does nothing but serves my fleshly existence, if I'm doing nothing with my life but trying to pad my pocket or, or gather together as much wealth as I can, so on and so forth, then I am sowing to the flesh, and from the flesh I will reap corruption. This has everything to do with our mindset toward giving, toward benevolence. We have to have an open heart and an open mind, ready to share that which God has blessed us with. I really appreciated what David said this morning as he was praying uh, before the collection. He prayed that we would recognize what we have is not ours, but it all belongs to God. And what we're doing when we put money in the collection plate is we are giving back to God part of what he gave to us. And so that's part of the mindset that we have to have because corruption awaits a life lived in sin. And eternal life, on the other hand, awaits a life lived in the Spirit. If we expect for God to give us the things that He's promised, we have to make sure that we are living a life in the Spirit. We are living a faithful life. Now, these two statements here are not just kind of stuck out there in the middle of nowhere in the book of Galatians. Remember, Paul has already talked about in this book the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He's already mentioned these things just the, pre the chapter previous. And so he's already discussed this idea of a fleshly life lived in sin or a spiritual life lived ser serving and following God. And so he's emphasizing these ideas here in chapter 6 where he's talking about our service to one another. Eternal life involves our service to one another and our dedication to doing that and our commitment to continuing to live that life. And so we see here this very stern warning. So how do we sow to the Spirit? Now, we're going to get to talking about benevolence here in a couple of minutes. But the question that, was, that needs to be asked here when Paul talks about having a, a, an eternal life awaiting us uh, involves us sowing to the Spirit, we need to ask the question, how do we sow to the Spirit? It's easy to sow to the flesh. It's easy to do that. Just do whatever you want to do. Follow the advice that you see on the television ads for, for the athletic apparel 
or the alcoholic beverages or whatever the case might be. Just do what you want to do and you will sow to the flesh without even trying. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But we want to know how do we sow to the Spirit. Well, there are a couple of things here. First, faith propels our actions. When we had our lesson on faith several weeks ago, we talked about faith being a belief strong enough to make you want to do something. Think about what the men uh, that were there on the day of Pentecost cried out to Peter after he had uh, preached this lesson. He said, men and brethren, what should we do? What must we do? What do we do next? Tell me, I know I need to do something. What is it? They had a belief strong enough to drive them to action. We have to have a faith that propels our action. You don't want to be guilted into something, right? You want to be driven because that's within you. If you have that faith, that saving faith, you are going to be driven to take on the actions that God wants you to take. We also need to focus on eternity, not just the here and now. Now, this is an interesting issue that we have when we think about benevolence because when you're doing something for someone, when you're providing some of the basic needs that someone has, what are we focusing on? What they need right here and right now. Okay? So we have to make sure we're not giving something just for the sake of giving that something. We have to give that something that's needed in the here and now with the understanding that there are some eternal values to that, and we have to focus on, as much as we can, those eternal values. If we go somewhere and we feed thousands, but we don't talk about the gospel, are we really doing God's work? Partly. But are we doing it completely? The answer to that question is no. Unless we are bridging the gap between here and now and eternity, we are not fully doing God's work. We also see that we need to have the right heart. We need to be sincere in all the things that we're doing. I've done a lot of work over the years. I've been in contact with a lot of people over the years, and I can tell you one thing. People who are in the world are looking to spot phonies as quickly as they can. We talked a little bit about that in Bible class this morning. People are looking for a way to knock down the message because of the problems or the flaws of the, with the messenger. But you see, when we have the right heart about us, we are going to be driven to try to do the right things. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have missteps, absolutely. But we need to be sincere in our desire to help others. Not just to provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, the, the things that are immediately needed, but we also need to be sincere in our desire to help see souls saved. If we're not trying to save souls, then we may as well be the Lions Club or the Rotary. Fine organizations both, don't get me wrong. But it's not their job, it's not their task that they've undertaken to help save souls. It is ours. And to do that, we again have to focus on eternity, but we also have to have the right heart about us. And we also need to learn to do good. Doing good things is not innate. Doing good things is not something we grow up knowing to do on our own. We have to be taught. We have to be trained. Little kids, when they're, when they're growing up, they have to be taught not to hit. They have to be taught not to bite. They have to be taught to share. They have to be taught to do all of those things. And we, as grown-ups... We're kind of like toddlers, aren't we? <laughs> we don't always know the right thing to do, and in fact, we're not always inclined to do that right thing. And so we have to know the value of it, and we have to know what those things are. And we need someone to guide us. And we need some good words, some wise words, some inspired words to guide us into doing what is good and what is right. And that's the focus of the rest of our lesson today. Because when we are called to do good as part of our spiritual lives to God, when we are called to do good as our service to the Lord, as the work of the church, we need to know what that is. I'm ready to do something. What is it? 
I'm ready to go. And there is nothing worse, and this is just kind of a side note, by the way, there's nothing worse than when somebody says we need to do something. No, you don't need to do something. You need to do something specific. What are those things? Well, let's look. There are some prerequisites to doing good and to doing benevolence. First of all, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18, we see here Paul tells Timothy that those who are rich should be required by their faith to do good works. Command those who are rich to be rich in good works, Paul tells Timothy. You see, when we have something to share, God wants us to share it. Whether it's our financial resources, our knowledge, our time, our expertise, whatever the case might be, when we are rich in something, God wants us to share that something. He has given us this gift, and now He wants us to do something with it. Not just something. <laughs> something specific. It reflects kind of where we're at in Bible class. We're going to talk about next week, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul tells us that we have this great treasure in these earthen vessels when he's talking about the gospel of Christ. We have this great treasure. Share it with the people who are around you. And so the idea here in 1 Timothy 6 is the idea of having financial wealth, but we can apply that lesson to about anything that we have that we can share. We also see here, again, a requirement for all who have something to share. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Knowledge of the gospel of Christ here and in 2 Corinthians 4, like I just mentioned. The idea that we have, uh, again, some wisdom. Uh, we have the idea of, of the knowledge of the scriptures, uh, of, of good advice in, for people who are in bad situations, uh, of time that we can spend with someone who is lonely or somebody who's isolated. We have all of these things that God has given to us. Now we need to share them, even if it's just... A cup of water, we're told. We also see here in 1 Thessalonians 5.15 that they must be done even in the face of evil. That gets to be a little more of a challenge, doesn't it? We go and we try to do something good, and people persecute us for it. We go and we try to do something good, and people call us names. We go and we try to do something good and people fight against us legally with the force of the law and the weight of the government behind them. We go and we try to do something good and people point and laugh and call us names and, and, and are we to shrink back in shame because of that? Absolutely not. And if we're just going out, here's, here's where the challenge is to me. This is, in, in my mind, this is where the challenge is. If we're just going out and we're going to give somebody some food, people say, oh yeah, very good, you did great. If we're going to go out and we're just going to provide somebody with clothing, the world is going to look at us and they're going to say, oh yeah, that's great, good job. I mean, think about all of the companies. There are some shoe companies out there. You buy a pair of shoes, and they're going to send a pair of shoes to some kid uh, in a third world country who doesn't have shoes, and that's great, and they get all sorts of applause for it. But think about it in the context of us sharing the gospel of Christ. You go and you give somebody something to eat, and you try to share the gospel, people are going to ridicule you. People are going to try to shame you. People are going to try to, to tell you that you are backwards or you're behind the times. You're uh, relying on this old barbaric book and you're trying to control people. And, and they're going to try to push back. And in some countries, in this world today, doing good with the power of the gospel puts your life in jeopardy. And so we think, oh man, in the U.S., maybe somebody's going to point, maybe they'll laugh, and, and maybe they'll call me some funny names or something like that. But you go to some of the other countries in this world, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Libya, places along those lines, you try to pro proclaim the gospel, it might cost you your life, but that is still something that everybody needs. And we should be ready to share, no matter what evil faces us in this life. We also see here, according to Matthew 19, 16, that they require us to remove anything that, become, that comes between us and God. If I'm going to do good, 
I have to put God first. I have to put God first. We can't serve two masters. I can't follow after my own personal wealth and do good for God. I can't follow and, and put my, my, even my own family first and do good for God. I have to take anything and everything that is between me and God and take it out of the way. My heart has to be pure. My motives have to be sincere. And they all have to be in the company of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, Paul talks about the fact that if I do all of these great things, if I give all that I have, if I even give my own body up, and I don't have love, it's all worthless. It's not done the way God wants it done. You see, it's very interesting because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is something that so many people look at and they say, oh, this passage is so beautiful, and it really is, but it's also in comparison to the other things the people in Corinth were doing. They, they, were, uh, they were trying to, to rank themselves by which preacher they followed and, and which miraculous spiritual gift they used and, and all these different things. And Paul tells them, I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Here is what's necessary. Love is necessary to make all of these things worthwhile. That self-sacrificing, that giving, that agape love that we see exemplified in Christ Jesus is necessary in our lives if we are going to be pleasing to God. It doesn't matter what else we do. If we don't love God and we don't love the people we serve, we have nothing. Let me say this again. The first one we already assume, we already understand, it's a given. If we don't love God, we have nothing. But if we don't love the people we are serving, we have nothing. Sometimes, sometimes, human beings. We serve others because we pity them. Sometimes we, we serve others because it suits our own ego. I want to be known as the person who helps. I want to be, I have my own savior complex. I want to be the one they look up to. Sometimes people do it for political gain, popularity, things along those lines. But if I look at someone and I'm not moved by compassion and by love to help that person, and my faith in God, my love for God, and my love for that person, if those things are not what drives me to help, then I have nothing. I have done nothing. I have accomplished nothing. We must love those whom we serve. We also see what doing good is. And according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, doing good is doing the things God has planned for us to do from the beginning. We are foreordained, predestined for good works. If we are following God, He has some jobs for us to do. There is one way you can look at this particular passage, and I find it absolutely fascinating. If those works are foreordained, did God create a work specifically for you? and perhaps even for you alone? Is there something that God has put in my life that I am the only one who's going to get that task done, and if I don't do it, it goes undone? That's possible. Think about that. God has created some very specific works for you to do, and He's placed them in your life for you to do. And if you don't do them, if I don't do them, then they don't get done. Doing good is doing what God planned for me, for us to do from the beginning. Doing good is also seeking justice, correcting oppression, bringing justice to the fatherless, and pleading for the widow, according to Isaiah 1.17, James 1.27. Now, this is true justice we're talking about. This is God's justice. I'm not sure 
that what the world calls justice right now is what God wants us to seek after. I'm not sure the political arguments that are going on right now are exactly what God is wanting us to seek after. But I think God is wanting us to understand that there are people out there who are facing injustice, real injustice. There are people out there who are facing real oppression. There are people out there who have no one to care for them. There are people out there who have no ability to fight their own fight. And those are the people we need once we see them, once we have opportunity. Those are the people that we need to help. doing these things. Doing good is also meeting the most basic needs of mankind. How can we look at someone and, and, and see that they have a lack of daily need and tell them, I'll pray for you, uh, I'll be warm and be filled and just go away. And then not do what's necessary for them to survive. James talks about it, James 2, John talks about it, 1 John as well. How can we claim we love somebody or love God that we haven't seen and, and, and mistreat a brother whom we have seen? We need to meet those most basic needs of those people who have a genuine need. Now, of course, this is balanced with what Paul tells the people in Thessalonica. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. We have to have some, some reasonable understanding of this. We have to have some balance here. But when someone is in genuine need, we should do the best we can to meet those basic needs. Those basic needs include food, water, clothing, shelter, companionship, and love, especially to the least among us. Matthew 25, verse 32 through 46. That is a basis for judgment. We must be about doing these good things. And finally, let's look at the result of doing good. And this is like an Apostle Paul, finally. We're going to keep going a little bit afterward, okay? The result of doing good. James 2, verses 18 through 20, we see that they demonstrate and justify our faith. They do not earn our salvation. We know that from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We understand that. But they do show our faith is alive and active. So doing good has as much to do with you as it does to the person that you're helping. It's important for us to be about doing this and to demonstrate that active faith that we have in our lives. John chapter, or 3 John verse 11 shows us that we are from God, shows that we are from God when we do good works. It's important for us to know this. It's important for us to understand this. You take this passage and other passages like Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 where we understand our good works reflect the goodness of our Heavenly Father. Helps draw praise to His name and to show the world that we have a loving Savior who's interested in them. Body and soul. The soul being the most important part, of course. We also see here, again, Matthew 5, 16, they give glory to God. When we do the right works with the right heart in the right manner, they show that we are from God and they give glory to our Heavenly Father. And once he, under, or once he has received that glory, people will be drawn to Him and to His kingdom. Benevolence primarily is about saving souls. If we do not have that understanding, we are missing one of the best things that we can do for another person, and that is to share with them the gospel of Christ. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, as we read at the very beginning, we see in time we will reap the harvest that we've sown. The farmer plants, sows the seed in the field, expecting later on to go out and to bring in the harvest. When we go out and we do good in the name of Christ, and we show others the gospel, and we share with them the good, that good news of Christ, even as we may be meeting the physical uh, and emotional needs that they have here and now, we need to be leading them toward heaven. 
And then when the time is right, when their faith comes full circle and leads them to Christ, we need to be ready to bring them into the kingdom. We need to be ready to fulfill the Great Commission, to go and to teach and to baptize and to continue to teach and make disciples out of all the nations and to show others the great blessings that we can have in our Savior. There are a lot of people in this world who do not know they need God. But that doesn't mean they don't need Him. There are a lot of people in this world who are never going to care how much you know, as the old cliche goes, until they know how much you care. There are a lot of people in this world who are going to see you doing good for others. And they're going to point to you and they're going to say, that's the right kind of person. Let me see what else they know. Let me see why they're doing what they're doing. Let me see why they're so driven and so motivated to help others. And maybe, just maybe, they'll hear why you're motivated. They'll hear you share the gospel of Christ with them. And they'll want to be part of the church. They'll want to take on these works themselves. They'll want to know more about Christ Jesus. And they'll want Him to wash their sins away by becoming obedient to the gospel. If you're here this morning and you are not yet a child of God, know that no matter what you do, you're still lacking one thing. Turning your life over to God becoming a child of God, being baptized to have your sins washed away, is the most important thing you can do. And it's going to motivate and propel your works from here on out. If you're here today and you are a child of God, but you find that you have turned away from your Heavenly Father and you need to repent of sin that's entered into your life and you need to be restored back to your place in His kingdom, know that you have an opportunity to do that today as well. Let that be the motivation for everything you do. And if you have any spiritual need, why don't you come meet me up front and let that need be made known as we stand and sing our invitation song.